to uh, welcome you. I, I am uh, studying, I, I am the new Sulevan, uh, <laughs> the temporary Sulevan. Um, I'm Chris Boyer, I'm a uh, professor of history of Latin American Latino studies and chair of the history department. Um, and uh, neither uh, Linda nor Sue uh, is available today. As you may know, Sue is away this uh, semester in Germany. And uh, Linda had uh, a uh, urgent, um, or actually, not urgent, but she's going to be here. Um, so, uh, felt the need to, uh, to introduce you uh, and to welcome you here. So, let me, let me do exactly that to welcome you to uh, today's presentation by Rachel Hammerwalk, uh, who is a fellow this year at the Institute uh, of her, of her uh, paper in the for her presentation called uh, Pipeline The Transport of Oil and the Making of the Modern Middle East. Um, and I will actually, I'm not the introducer, I'm actually going to introduce the introducer. Um, so allow me to give you a little bit of uh, uh, advertising for the next event, what I assume to be the next event, uh, at the Institute, or at least the next uh, fact, uh, fellow uh, presentation, which is going to be by the uh, doctoral fellow, one of the two doctoral fellows, um, Melissa Hibbert, who's here with us right now, uh, who will be giving a presentation on February 5th, which is coming right up, um, titled Children of the Polish Republic, Child, Child Health, Welfare, and the Shaping of Modern Poland, 1914 to 1939, and that'll be at 5 o'clock on the 5th. Um, so to present the presenter <laughs> uh, is Nasser Mufti, who's a professor of English and Asian Studies uh, here at UIC. His work centers on uh, Victoria literature and cultural studies, uh, with an emphasis on the <coughs> and So that's what we do. Infection, I guess. Um, so rather than following the usual trajectory of academic infections, um, I want to, I guess, make something just of an observation. Um, I think Professor Havelock can perhaps best be described as what um, Edward Say meant by the term intellectual. For Say, the intellectual is someone, quote, with the vocation for the art of representing, whether it is talking, writing, teaching, appearing on television, end quote. <laughs> this art of representing, for say, must take place within the concrete confines of the university, <laughs> but also, crucially, uh, in, the, in the more open, if colder, public context. That the intellectual move between these two worlds, posing questions back and forth from one another, is, for say, essential to humanism and humanistic inquiry. It is precisely this versatility, rigor, and attention to the two worlds of the intellectual that Professor Havelock's work exemplifies. In what follows, I will not offer a chronology of publications, a list of qualifications and achievements, of which, by the way, Professor Havelock has very many, but a sketch of how her work has negotiated these two worlds of the intellectual. Her book, River Jordan, The Mythology of the Dividing Line, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2011, weaves together biblical studies, literary studies, political theory, and the historical archive to look at how the Jordan River has functioned as a border. The book tracks the politics of representation at the center of the river's biblical, political, and national history, especially as it has shaped and energized the national imaginations of Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. But while the Jordan River, both ancient geographic feature and mytho-literary figure, might represent national borders in one context, Professor Havelock's advocacy work illustrates that it is also the occasion for questioning these very borders. She has, for some years now, been involved with Eco Peace Middle East, an NGO, a transnational NGO, that brings together Jordanian, Palestinian, and Israeli environmentalists to advocate for a sustainable future of the river and its shared peace <coughs> amongst three oftentimes warring political communities. Eco Peace, incidentally, spoke at the Institute, I think, about a year and a half ago. The commitment to thinking about uh, to thinking across borders, these specific borders, is also evident in her work as a playwright. Her play from Tel Aviv to Ramallah, for example, explores everyday life of uh, Israeli and Palestinian youth and has been produced in more cities than I have time to list. <laughs> Back in the university, Professor Havelock is currently completing a book titled The Joshua Generation, Politics and the Promised Land, which looks at how the book of Joshua, the biblical story of the people of Israel's conquest of the land of Canaan, is both the mythological and historical DNA of modern-day Jewish nationality. Her book takes the reader into the debate surrounding the interpretation of this text, as well as into the home of Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, who in 1958 organized a reading group, interestingly, on the book of Joshua, hoping 
solidify Israeli national identity around Joshua's imagery. But even here, we see Rachel stepping beyond the thresholds, concrete thresholds of Harrison and Halstead, and thinking through these questions with the public. She has, for example, co-hosted the television show Who, is she? Who Was She? It's about the Discovery Channel and History Channel, where she discussed the significance of the book of Joshua for a wider audience. In other media and venues, she has written for blogs like the Huffington Post, edited publications um, for the Association of Jewish Studies, for example, and presented at Chicago's own Humanities Festival. Throughout all of Professor Havelock's work, we might say that what is at, consistently at stake is the category of land, which she teaches us is never just a simple given, but it ascribed its national meanings via religious texts, political discourse, literature, and of course, the map. So to sum up, recall Said's list of venues for intellectual activity, talking, writing, teaching, appearing on television. <laughs> Professor Havelock's work, work exceeds this list. When we do it, we can have the internet, in the theater, and on the ground. Today, however, we look beneath land, beneath the political maps of the connecting nation states occupied territories, to the subterranean foundations of the modern nation state. Not water, but the other substance that has been the threshold, oh sorry, the, the lifeblood of modernity, not the threshold of modernity, oil. Professor Havelock's most recent book project, Pipeline, The Transport of Oil and the Making of the Middle East, argues that it is oil companies and oil pipelines, and not state powers, that establish the national boundaries and forms of sovereignty in the Middle East. Nations, we learn, don't emerge out of nowhere but along the contours of imperial resource extraction. And that the same historical character, oil, which probably made our trips to campus a little bit cheaper to date, um, remains central to the Middle East and to the West, illustrates just how important and timely this project is. So I ask you all to welcome to Professor Rachel If nothing else happens today, I can walk away and say uh, uh, Saidian definition uh, uh, introduced me. I really appreciate it. Thank you to, to Chris for being our fearless leader and to all of you for coming today. Um, so just before we go out on this uh, journey across the pipeline, I thought I would outline some of the broader strokes of the argument and what I'm saying here. So I think that we all, it, it's quite a reflex, and somewhere along the line we all have the sense, especially about speaking of um, what we might call one long, endless war in Iraq, is being about oil. Right? It's a phrase that we throw around quite a bit, and we have that sensibility. So part of what this research involves is how is it about oil, and, um, and what does that really mean, and what's the historical trajectory in which um, this endless war or these many wars have been about oil. And the other uh, strategy that I want to outline at the beginning is, and this is something again uh, I'm sort of taking on common sense or a media refrain, that there is much blame about territorial nationalism, right? Middle Eastern territorial nationalism. And we're quite used to seeing it as virulent, as violent, as intractable. Um, and again, uh, to pick up a note of what Nasser was saying, as um, inextricably linked to land, territory. And that is not an incidental association, as I would like to point out today. The third um, common sense bit of all of this that we're also hearing about quite a bit uh, from different fronts is sectarian tension. And this also has the sense of <coughs> that it has some long-standing ancient genealogy or is inextricably tied to religious interpretation. And actually, I used to think that um, in certain ways myself. And what I really want to do in part today is to show how sectarian tensions and the way many of these so-called sectarian tensions are playing themselves out are not incidental. Uh, many of them were put in place over the course of oil extraction and transport for some very specific reasons. Now, is this you know, to let everyone who's carrying a gun or wielding ideology or religious interpretation off the hook? No, it's not. But um, at the same time, I think that we very much want to see uh, this system of war, 
of resource extraction um, and aerial surveillance and different forms of surveillance which, which have increased uh, all on a continuum. The other thing I wanted to say is that it turns out, I thought at the beginning with this research, that it was great to find a pipeline that only operated for 13 years. Because of a pipeline that operated for 13 years, it means it's a very constrained time period, and that seemed very nice to me. Uh, but it turns out it's a 100-year story, and I am not going to keep you here for 100 years today. I absolutely uh, promise I'm going to concentrate a little more on the beginning of the story because that's where I've done uh, much of the research, and hopefully in the Q&A or in some closing remarks, I can signal to how some of these things um, have, uh, have, um, have played out. So again, part of what this central argument is, is that how substances move underground and who moves them exert influence on configurations of sovereignty above. So in order to understand Middle Eastern history in this way, I want to expose the world's first transnational pipeline that conveyed crude oil from Kirkuk to Haifa. But calling it a transnational pipeline already conceals the fact that the nations in question and the connections between them were created in the image of the pipeline. Now, Metal tubes conveying liquid might not seem like the subject of compelling narrative. <laughs> but if we miss the connections created by pipelines, we miss an essential aspect of political history. And pipelines further manifest the flows of transnational capital in the most material terms and reveal how state and administrative procedures ensure the closure of circuits of benefit. Okay, so here is um, uh, the original map, proposed map of the pipeline, and here's uh, Kirkuk, um, and the pipeline ran through the Anbar province to this um, point of um, Haditha, and then it, it bifurcated, and I'll, I'll tell the story a little bit, but this line right here, this upper line, sorry, um, was essentially the French line. So I'll show you the map in a moment, but, but these, this pipeline route, as I will argue here today, uh, these two routes were determined before the Middle East was divided into two zones of colonial influence, the British zone and the French zone, um, in the Sykes-Picot Accord. And I will show you the map. And we're hearing again a lot about how the current unrest, the current wars in the Middle East are the ends of Sykes-Picot. So here we're going back to this beginning of Sykes-Picot. So the French um, had a line that ran through French territorial control. I won't be talking about that line today or, or much ever. Um, <laughs> um, but I will just say in a moment, this pipeline was only recently closed down. Um, amidst the uprising in Syria. So this pipeline has a much longer history. Uh, this line that went um, from Haditha down through the rest of Anbar and into what was then Transjordan and out through Haifa was the, uh, the British line. The pipeline that went entirely through British controlled territory and I mean, there's a lot of jockeying around here for ownership <coughs> of the oil, but we um, are safe to say that this is um, the Iraq Petroleum Company pipeline, and for all intents and purposes, the Iraq Petroleum Company is BP. It had a couple different name changes, but it's the British line insofar as it went through British colonial territory, and that it was um, then the British National Oil Company. So while I'm uh, telling you a bit more about the, uh, the pipeline, I just want to <coughs> alert you to this red line there where you can see it's um, marked below is the Haifa-Baghdad Railway. Here in my first slide, this was the file, Haifa-Baghdad Railway and or pipeline. You can see in 100 years, uh, our transport of oil still seems to have the same two options, uh, <laughs> whether it's uh, from the Canada to the US or from, um, from Kirkuk to Haifa. And so this railroad, I think the best description of this never-built railroad comes from the, um, the mouth of the director of the Iraq Petroleum Company, 
where he was constantly in negotiation with Iraqi officials who desperately wanted this railroad built. They wanted it built for transport of workers. They thought that this was the lifeline of the Iraqi state to export agricultural goods. Uh, and it was always kind of dangled in front of them, this railway. Cad, <laughs> Sir John Cadman, the, the uh, director of the Iraq Petroleum Company, in some of his personal notes says, I'm so sick of conducting negotiations with this ghost in the background. It is a ghost railway that we have no intention to build and never will be built. So public transit was sort of, you know, this <coughs> promise um, hung in front of them. So here, uh, here uh, are the maps. And the pipelines, the two in, uh, in purple, were conceived just before the First World War and completed in 1935. Now, there's a kind of an allure <laughs> about saying that this is a pipeline that once connected Iraq to Israel. However, to phrase it in that way already elides the process in which the nations of Iraq and Jordan and Israel came into being with the making of the pipeline and suppresses the tandem unmaking of places like Kurdistan and Palestine. So the borders, the governments, the militaries of these states and pseudo-states came into being as a result of the oil industry. The Kirkuk Haifa pipeline ceased functioning in 1948 after the British mandate ended and the first Arab-Israeli war began. Although closing the pipeline was intended as an act of hostility toward the nascent Jewish state, the Iraqi closure of the pipeline was the first of many acts of political self-assertion on the point of Iraqi leaders vis-a-vis -vis the companies with controlling shares um, of the oil. Okay, so something that this map also um, shows us um, it goes back into what I was saying before about the, the critical focus on Middle Eastern territorial nationalism. And this focus recapitulates an imperial division of space into subterranean surface and aerial sectors. And this kind of division of space was exactly what was implemented with the building of the pipeline. And I'll, I'll go through and, and tell you about some of them. But every single treaty, every concession, right? every time that a colonial power sat down to negotiate with anybody local on the ground, absolutely ensured and confirmed that no leader, civic community, even national, had any control over the mineral wealth underground. That was always owned um, by um, by these companies, by these corporations. At the same time, the building of the pipeline, and you can see it, it's hard for me to move around this PowerPoint, but you can see it right here. This is the Royal uh, Air Force route, Cairo to Baghdad. It was also um, used by the British um, to fly Egypt to India. So the air route uh, coincided with the route um, of the pipeline. So it meant that as a um, these states were put into being. They had no control over the underground mineral wealth. They were under aerial surveillance, which was quite nicely controlled. And so it meant that any kind of sovereignty that came into being was, shall we say, over the thin crust of land that was over everything of value. It was territorial um, by, by um, definition. And the surveillance was not only aerial surveillance, but um, there, there were these various systems of, of management. So for example, the Air Ministry, in figuring out the air route, um, conducted a survey of the people living below and determined where were their populations who would be the most hostile to colonial infrastructure. And so the air route would be sure to have a sort of base or a landing strip right down in those areas. So the land, in fact, was surveyed about what needed to most be controlled um, from above, along with the air ministry. The company itself um, 
also sent out a team of who else but anthropologists um, to determine the different populations living around the proposed part of the pipeline, different Bedouin tribes, um, some uh, Jewish communities living there, the, um, the Wahhabi uh, Ahwan, the brothers, and to figure out who was the most hostile. So there was this whole sense of understanding space in terms of, um, of um, this hostility and then subjecting those populations to uh, particular forms um, of surveillance. Okay, so many of you probably understand this and many of you were even probably there when uh, Timothy Mitchell spoke about his book, Carbon Democracy, here at UIC. And the book is important to me. Um, Mitchell has a couple arguments. The one that, that's most important to me for this is that he said, we might think that oil extraction would be a very rapid process, right? That as soon as oil was found in the oil regions of Kirkuk and Mosul, that you would want to get it out and make money. Well, Mitchell uh, does a wonderful job in that book of showing how it wasn't the case. And in fact, after the oil was discovered, there was, um, close to a 14-year delay period of debating where, what would be the route of the pipeline, how thick would it be, you know, where, what water sources would serve it, and Mitchell makes the point that oil was brought to European markets, in fact, very slowly, because initially it had no market. So a market had to be created. People um, used kerosene in their homes, coal fuel industry. So oil had to literally be brought out in a trickle. The point at which the pipeline was complete was the point um, when uh, Winston Churchill became Minister of Defense and switched the British Navy from coal to oil. And Churchill has an interesting story here because Churchill, sort of, one of his early positions is at the Ministry of Fuel and Energy. He. Uh, what do they call it on our ethics exam? He had a revolving door <laughs> to sit on the board of the Iraq Petroleum Company. So he goes from the government position to sit on the board. He, the door revolves again, and he comes back and is Minister of Defense. And at that point, he switches the British Navy over to oil. That is the point at which oil becomes necessary, and that is the point when the pipeline construction was complete. And so Mitchell makes that argument, and I actually went um, it seems so hard for me to believe that I went and checked all the files in the archive, and the stalling is unbelievable. I mean, meeting after meeting about diameter of pipeline, you know, and what kind of soil goes through. But at the same time, I um, want to introduce a kind of a corrective for Mitchell. Because Mitchell accounts for the militarization of this region of the world at the point of nationalization. Right, there's a little window. In my 100-year story, we start with private control of all mineral wealth. And the story, you might already know, ends with private control of all mineral wealth. Within that, there are these little windows. Um, Iraq has a little window. Israel has a little window. Jordan has no window. Um, there are these little moments at which resources are nationalized. And Mitchell says it's the moment when leaders nationalize things like oil that you have massive arms sales to a country like Iraq in order that the oil wealth not actually promote a democratic system, right? Mitchell argues the oil companies don't want a democratic system because then you wouldn't have an autocrat and his friends who make the money from the oil, right? This mineral wealth would literally spread and it would, you know, challenge all kinds of extant systems. So Mitchell says in order to prevent uh, democratization of resources, at that point, Western arms companies start selling all of this money so they don't actually lose the oil profits that just comes into their markets in that way. That's Mitchell's argument. So he sees nationalization working hand in hand with militarization. I want to move the date of that way, way back because it seems at the very moment when the route is being planned, and as I will show you, the moment when the pipeline route is established, the space is militarized at that point. And it is also at that point that a lot of these sectarian tensions are put into place. 
So Mitchell, uh, Carbon Democracy, his book is a huge um, book for me, but at the same time it also helps me clarify like exactly where in the timeline I, um, I uh, want to correct it. Okay, so how um, might a company go about uh, owning everything which is underground? Um, this, uh, the first technique, is the concession. Right, the concession uh, is um, a process in which an individual or a company can go in and acquire parcels of um, ownership and control over uh, everything that is underground. Now there's a kind of an interesting story um, of how the concessions work. I'm going to skip over it a little bit, but I'll tell you that the, the sort of first player in the Kirkuk Wells was Deutsche Bank. Um, Deutsche Bank gets cut out later on after World War I, and then the players are essentially BP, um, the French National Oil Company, and then after a little bit of delay but not much, the American Standard Oil um, comes in. So we're basically talking about Shell, BP, and Exxon Mobil, and um, one uh, Armenian businessman who was known as Mr. 5%, who managed to constantly maintain his um, Five percent um, is five percent ownership, and so here, and, and this is a story we can talk about after. But the company was first called the Turkish Petroleum Company. Uh, there were a handful of Turks in the Turkish Petroleum Company when um, this concession treaty was written. Is this the same moment when it becomes the Iraq Petroleum Company? There was not one Iraqi in the Iraq Petroleum Company. Um, and I just like this moment. And when the, the concession, when the company acquired the concession in Iraq is the moment that it changed its name. And it's nice to know that in the Treasury you can just simply um, change your um, name. And then um, I guess like every entity that controls everything that is underground, um, one needs a, uh, a company flag. And there was the um, Iraq Petroleum. Okay. Okay. So I want to uh, come to World War One, which, among other things, allowed for the restructuring of territory in order to reflect resource ownership. This is T. E. Lawrence's map, his hand-drawn map that he disseminated among his Arab allies uh, during the uprising against the Ottoman Empire. So there's a, a few things I want to point out about um, Lawrence's map and how it fits in with the story of the pipeline. There's a lot of questions about Lawrence and this map. Did he believe it? Was he simply disseminating it in order to urge and inspire Arabs to fight with him against the Turks? I mean, is it completely cynical? Was he duped? Was he duping other people? There's a lot of questions around Lawrence and his intentions with the map. But what it does show is, on the one hand, that he promised the widest swath of the territory to his comrade in arms, Faisal, and hang on to that name. Um, he doesn't know, Lawrence doesn't know, or doesn't state what would happen to Palestine after World War I. You see how it's simply called Palestine. There's something very important here. Sorry, this is a little shaky. Does everyone see that red area? Okay, that red area indicates direct British control. That is Haifa Bay. And the fact that Lawrence, and you know, his relationship to the colonial authorities is a shifting and uh, multiple um, thing, but Lawrence knows that Haifa Bay is going to fall under direct British control because already when Lawrence is in the field in the First World War, a sense of a pipeline conveying oil from um, northern Kurdish fields out to a Mediterranean port was already known. So Lawrence doesn't know what's going to happen to Palestine, but he knows the Haifa port will fall under British control. Um, he also knows that this area of Iraq will fall under direct um, British control. Okay, why the question marks? They still stand 100 years later? It's Kurdistan. And Lawrence simply does not know what is promised, what will be, what will happen to the Kurds. So the Kurds, as I said, you know, same question mark hovers 100 years later. The Kurdish areas are um, uh, governed by these question marks. 
And Lawrence imagines that Iraq will fall under um, the rule of Abdullah, one of the sons of the Emir of Mecca, and that this other, you know, sort of greater Syria, hear about this today too, that greater Syria would fall under the rule of Faisal. What ends up happening, I'll talk about it in a moment, is that Abdullah ends up in Jordan and Faisal in Iraq. But this is uh, how Lawrence understands it. Of course, Lawrence's map is not what restructured the Middle East after World War I. Instead, it's this map. And this is the hand-drawn map of Sir Mark Sykes uh, by everyone's account, a kind of second-rate geographer and even worse diplomat, who, um, <coughs> during the fighting, uh, in the Middle East in World War I, set up zones of influence with the French representative Georges Picot. So area B is the area of British influence, and area A, the area of French influence. Again, oh, sorry, that's the same map, but not uh, as original. Again, the Haifa Bay is bright red, direct British control, as are the oil fields in bright red, direct British control. Now the argument that I want to make with this map, and maybe this helps you see it better, is that what determined, and we hear a lot about the carve of the Middle East into French and British zones of control, but what determined these lines? Well, if you look at the route of the pipeline, you can see that they almost exactly conform to the idea of a separate British and French pipeline. Why a separate British and French pipeline? Well, in World War I, um, the reasoning was that they were allies, but would uh, another war emerge <clears throat> when they weren't allies? They simply did not want to have their oil supply vulnerable to the other. So this, again, these zones of control, which were colonial governmental zones of control, emerged because there was already a decision that part of the motivation for going into war in World War I was to have control over the Iraqi oil fields and to eventually transport that to Europe, and that would be done <coughs> along um, these two separate um, vectors. And so let me just go back for a moment, as you can see it here. So this line persists as the border between Jordan and Iraq and Syria and Iraq. Right? Very talked about border right now, but here is um, its genesis. So with the Sykes-Picot line as a basis, the powers put subsequent divisions in place. It's also significant that the French exchanged the region of Mosul for British support of French policies in Syria and a cut of the oil from Mosul. After these surface areas gained definition as spheres of influence, the colonial powers set up systems of government. The semblance of local autonomy and the reality of foreign ownership of everything of value took different forms. The organizing principle was that of the mandate, ostensibly a form of European handholding on the way to national independence recognized internationally at the post-war conferences of Paris and San Remo. Mandates were intended as strategies of political management to protect European and American ownership of resources while keeping the prices of labor low. Obsessed with costs, officials at home always stressed a policy of no annexation. Uh, instead, hand-picked local rulers should persuade the populace to comply with the mandate. The rulers had no say over resource management, no ability to confer labor benefits, and no means of persuading the oil companies to drill. Um, so in tandem, so the San Remo Conference after World War I, which created Iraq, legitimated the oil concession of the Iraq Petroleum Company. So Iraq literally comes into being with its concession. That is the genesis of the nation state. And when Iraqi representatives voice complaint outside the hall, they never got into San Remo, but they were like outside in the hallways, um, they were threatened with losing Mosul to Turkey. So when they um, said, we don't like this possibility, they said, OK, well, then Mosul will go back uh, to Turkey. 
constrained by borders and mandates and alienated from their natural resources. Uh, Arab nationalists across the region rebelled against their new overlords in 1920. So Faisal, who had fought with, um, with uh, against the Turks with Lawrence, tried to establish rule over all Syria with the backing of the Syrian National uh, Congress after the French drove him out of Syria and put down the rebellion, the British brought him to Iraq as king. So that's how Faisal um, comes to Iraq. And of course, when he's brought as king, he doesn't get greater Syria, but he's brought as king, there is the expectation that he will, at all turns, pay the British back by um, securing and enabling um, their control. But in 1920, Iraqi nationalists were also in the midst of a rebellion against the mandate in general and the heavy tax burden, burden of the colonial authority in particular. At this moment in Iraq, a new lexicon accompanies the colonial ordering of um, space. Those who oppose the mandate system, and here's where the coin, where the term is coined, were labeled extremists. By virtue of their extreme demand, they could be attacked by land and air. So that becomes policy in 20. That anyone who's against the mandate or um, tries to sabotage the oil infrastructure is an extremist, which means you could be attacked by land and air. Their moderate counterparts um, could be instead placated by proof of our constitutional intention or discussion of electoral law. So it's a two-pronged strategy. The people that are really against this, okay, they can be um, attacked. Um, the moderates could be strung along by political promises, but extremists could not be other than military subjects. This way of dividing the population, coupled with practices emphasizing Sunni, Shia, and Kurdish differences, um, persisted long after the Indian divisions of the British military put down the 1920 rebellion and Faisal became king over the thin surface covering the oil. Okay. Um, so after Iraq is established, I'm going to move through this a little bit um, more quickly, but, but I don't want to forget this, uh, this key treaty in 1925 which further embeds um, the Iraq Petroleum Company um, concession. And um, in this 1925 agreement, it meant that the Iraqi government relinquished all claims to the subterranean sphere. So in 1925, it wasn't just oil and mineral wealth, it was also water. Like they got it all in 1925 and received no share in the oil pump. Now this year is really important because the concession lasted for 75 years. It meant it was from 1925 until the year 2000. Now the concession was abrogated, not in theory but in practice, when Saddam Hussein nationalized oil in 1972. Um, but what's so interesting is even though he nationalized oil, it, it's still so wild to me. You know, nationalization never meant the annulment of these concessions. It just meant the concession was nationalized. So Saddam Hussein's government took on the, the force of the concession. This is a little bit of the genesis of the Saddam Hussein's relationship with the Kurds, right? Because it meant the concession meant that he had um, absolute control. But it's also quite interesting that the concession set to um, expire in 2000. And the records say, OK, in 2000, you know, we'll figure out a way to renew the concession. Um, we just can't help but think about the years of the US Gulf War, um, 1990 and then 2003. So you know, the, I don't know. I'm not going to go on about that. We'll talk about that. <laughs> um, I'll just give you the years. Um, ah. Now, the only thing that the Iraqi government um, could get out of it, because in the meantime, as this concession is going on, the Iraqi government is going into terrible debt, because they still have to run a country, and they still have to police all of the extremists. It has to come out of the Iraqi national budget, but they're not receiving any oil revenue. So what does the company do benevolently? It starts loaning the money with high interest that they'll pay back to the company once the company starts pumping oil. So they start developing this debt to the company for the oil that is um, underneath them. And then at one point, when Faisal turns and he says, I can't run this anymore, you know, if, if 
we don't have funding. There was a modification to the treaty which bound the company to construct a pipeline to a port for export shipment as soon as that course should be commercially justifiable. So when it's justifiable for us, um, we will um, build it. Okay. Um, meanwhile, I, I focused um, a bit on Iraq. There is a, a similar concession in Transjordan. That concession, which is put into place in 1925, um, gives um, BP and Shell uh, the concession to all the mineral wealth of Jordan for 100 years. So that concession is still operative. Now, no one thought that concession was worth anything because Jordan has no oil until fracking comes. And um, there is shale in eastern Jordan. And fracking had commenced um, uh, two summers ago uh, in Jordan. Guess by whom? Shell and BP. And guess under what, um, what legal structure? The concession. So, I mean, in fact, it was never <coughs> aggregated in Jordan. The company still hold it. So ne never annulled in Jordan um, whatsoever. <coughs> now, meanwhile, um, at this same time, and, and we're uh, going to get there, of course, um, with the mandate in Palestine also comes the efforts of the Zionist movement to um, establish immigration and, um, and Jewish communities <coughs> there. And what is... Um, kind of ironic in all of this is that while the colonial powers are uh, you know, maneuvering to at least have concessions over the oil, the Zionist movement is pressing the British authorities for um, access and control over water. So they're sort of you know, maybe behind the carbon times, but they're perpetuating this idea of redemption of uh, the Jewish body, um, amelioration of um, Jewish alienation from territory and land through agriculture. And they're also trying to imagine how the Eastern European Jews that they envision one day coming will eat. So they're, meanwhile, very busy pressing uh, the British government and, and <clears throat> negotiating for sites with um, water sources. Now, there is evidence, and that's actually how I came to this whole story, that the idea of a terminal in the Haifa port initially um, up till about the late 30s, uh, did predispose um, British uh, colonial officials positively towards the idea of Zionism. And that is actually where I first read about the pipeline, was in a discussion of, um, of borders and how the colonial office felt about Zionism. And they say quite, um, quite pointedly, we know that there's going to be a pipeline, and we know that it's going to end in Haifa. So we have to ask ourselves, who do we want at the end of the pipeline? They said, who is least likely to sabotage the pipeline and to prevent the oil from reaching Europe? They said, well, we think, you know, based on 1920 and the rebellions, we think the Arabs are unlikely to get the oil to us from Haifa. And they're like, but these Zionists are pressing for land. Um, what if we put them in Haifa? And they developed the Haifa port with their own capital and labor. And that really fit in. Remember, I mean, there's, there is this kind of cost anxiety all the time by the colonial government. I and mean, you sort of wonder, like, what were they thinking as they were like shooting down people in Iraq? Well, they were thinking about the cost. I mean, at least that's what the, what the records say. And they're like kind of cost obsessed um, all of the time. And so they, they sort of imagine that having a beholden group of Jews will be very good for oil transport. And in fact, some of the first um, encouragement of Jewish development is, um, is, uh, in, the, is in the, the Haifa, um, Haifa war. Uh, one more thing I just wanted to say about these mandatory governments. The mandatory governments are working in tandem with the oil companies and the Ministry of Fuel and Energy is working in tandem. But at the same time, we again have states in the form of colonial administrations paying for much of the development and policing of infrastructures and policies that benefit oil companies. So you know, the, the mandatories themselves are sort of wondering when they're going to recoup their money. But there's a tremendous sense in which the policing isn't done by the oil companies. Surprise, surprise. The policing is done by the colonial authorities. They are the ones um, 
they are the ones um, paying for it. Okay. So before um, the building began in, um, in the mid-30s, the company demanded that they would not be taxed at sites of extraction and transport, that the military would gain, that the pipeline would gain military protection, and that sufficient water would reach its pumping station. And so just as Arab extremists came into being with the mandates, so the issue of security accompanied discussion of the pipeline. And that is the moment when the Air Ministry sends out its surveyors. It's the moment when the company sends out its anthropologists to compile this uh, record of, um, of all of the tribes. And then um, the question becomes, how exactly will the pipeline benefit local residents? Because that's always the promise. Right? Your country will be rich once the pipeline's built. Well, yeah, there's some question of how. Well, okay, on the one hand, uh, construction of the pipeline, and it um, was laborious and even went under rivers like the Tigris and the Jordan, and it's still there under those rivers um, today. So it meant, and there was no taxation, no transit tax, no extraction tax, no export tax. In fact, the sites of extraction and um, as well as the Haifa Bay and export are extraterritorial zones. Again, many of these are still in, uh, in place. There's uh, no system of taxation. So this meant that local residents could only um, gain benefit from the pipeline by guarding it. Okay, so they could be the, um, the police and um, because it was determined as a course of policy that anything stopping the flow of oil, aside from company procrastination, required military um, intervention. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. So the pipeline was finished in 1935. And oil flowed through its course for about a year until 1936 when Iraq found the treasury empty and had no means of paying for its administration. So reluctant to step even further into debt, the Iraqi Minister of Finance filed a report with the IPC to postpone payments of Iraq's debts to the company. Between 1927, when the IPC struck oil, and 1935, when the pipeline opened, um, uh, the company uh, loaned the government more funds, and um, after its opening, uh, Iraq was even in worse financial straits. So what could they do at that point? How could they run the government? Um, there was a, an exchange, a stay of debt, uh, and at that moment, the IPC's concession um, stretched into the Persian Gulf. So since the concession already covered everything underground, um, they said you don't have to pay back your debts as long as our concession, in fact, um, goes into the, the bed um, of the Gulf. Okay, now 35 also saw the first labor action against the pipeline. Uh, it began in an infrastructure installation um, in Haifa, and it was at this moment that the Communist Party starts to get involved, trying to organize uh, workers to demand um, you know, not part of the profits, but better wages. So there was a very successful strike. Um, at the Haifa uh, refinery wasn't built yet at this installation in 35, and it was largely due to communist organizing. At that point, in 35, the company comes up with the idea that in order to stop the communist menace, that workers' uh, ethnic affiliations would have to be exacerbated every place where the pipeline flowed. So what did this mean? It meant in 1935 that um, company officials, British company officials, started speaking to Arab labor leaders and saying you had best not work in a communist party with the Zionists do you not understand that they're coming here to take your land? So there was a concerted policy. This um, happened, uh, it sort of accelerated a little bit later, but it was around this time that this also began in Iraq. Iraq in the 30s and the 40s had a very well-organized Communist Party and huge popular support. 
and a lot of the organizers were Iraqi Jews. There was one very famous strike in Haditha, which is the bifurcation point of the pipeline. It was a place where there were massive land expropriations to build the pipeline. Because guess what else happens when you build a pipeline? Is you don't have to reimburse anyone, you know, when the pipeline goes through their, through um, their property. So there was one um, famous strike at uh, Haditha. The strikers were fired on um, by company guards, and then leaflets were dropped. Um, in which they said, um, oh, uh, we're Arab workers of Iraq, do not listen to the communist organizers. They are only Zionists in disguise. So there was a massive propaganda machine that began in order to try to break the power of the Communist Party. Another strategy that worked in Iraq is that the officials, uh, the local officials, were always of minority groups. Um, sometimes Jews, but also different Christian minority groups in <coughs> Iraq. And so the idea was, right, that you would constantly do this kind of divided rule um, of, the, of the population. So that was the policy um, in dealing with the Communist Party. But um, in 1936, uh, a greater strategy of sabotage began. Here is the pipeline um, set on fire. During the 1936 to 1939 um, uh, Palestinian um, Palestinian rebellion. Now, there's a couple interesting questions about this because attacking the pipeline in the way that uh, rebels did it is they would go to the pipeline and cut an opening and just set it on fire and it would burn all night. Uh, this was a, a very common mode of sabotage. I'll tell you. Uh, at least one scholar has noticed um, that the Mufti of Jerusalem, um, Hajjim al Husseini, spent part of the years of the rebellion living in Berlin. And um, remember, I told you Deutsche Bank got cut out of the concession uh, after World War One. So there is some belief that Deutsche Bank wanted its way back in, and part of the revenge on the British was in fact financing the Mufti of Jerusalem stayed during the rebellion because there were radio broadcasts where he would come on the radio and say, oh, rebels, you know, go out, attack the pipeline, attack infrastructure. Now, this um, 1936 is a key moment because it is the moment in which attacking or guarding the pipeline uh, becomes a key moment of Arab-Jewish opposition as well as the point in which it becomes pointedly militarized. So the pipeline is being attacked. It runs um, uh, in Mandy, Palestine. It ran through the Jezreel Valley, where there were many Jewish agricultural communities, keep it safe. Um, they're living there. And so the idea was, how was the pipeline going to be guarded? One British official by the name of Wingate decided that he would create special night squads of Jews living in these agricultural <coughs> communities and that they would go out at night and other times and they would begin policing the pipeline. This moment, and here is um, one of the special night squads, this was the first time that the British Mandate Administration allowed Jews in Palestine to legally carry guns. Until this moment, it was illegal for any Jew to have a gun, but at the moment at which they were guarding the pipeline, they were given guns, and they were told that they could go out after any rebels and do what was necessary to protect the pipeline. So not only do you have these two groups who end up at odds, but it's also a moment in which guns are put into their hands. As the uh, Arab rebellion was taking place in Palestine, the British sent out a commission to figure out what to do. This is the Peel Commission. And this is also the origin of the idea of partition as a solution to Jewish um, Arab animosity. Now, you can't see it so well in this map. Maybe you can see it better. What's important for me to show you is that in all partition plans during the 30s and the 40s, the entire, sorry, the entire run of the pipeline was always in Jewish territory. I'm trying to show you with this PowerPoint. It's very sensitive to mine. All right, so here's the pipeline. It was always imagined as being entirely in Jewish territory. So not only does guarding the pipeline um, 
enabled Jewish militarization, but it also, um, the pipeline always, and every, um, every decision um, ends up, um, ends up uh, in Jewish land. Okay, so the pipeline um, does run through the 40s. It, you know, is attacked uh, after 1939. It becomes attacked much more seldomly um, by Arab rebels and um, uh, Jewish um, uh, right-wing, <coughs> call them terror group, militia, or whatnot. Um, the Edsel, they take their notes from the Palestinian rebels and they start attacking the pipeline and the infrastructure. So this whole idea of sabotage becomes, especially sabotage of the pipeline, becomes a key way um, in which uh, the pipeline uh, or the British control um, is attacked. Okay, so as I said before, um, 1948 marked the end of the line uh, from Kirkuk to Haifa. And ultimately, this era of Jewish animosity, which began in the 30s, did not allow for any modes of connection. Now, this became clear in the very first month of fighting in the 1948 war, in December 1947, when one might argue the war, um, that's how they go, uh, the war began at the refinery. So what happened in 1947, um, that same Jewish right wing group that was desperate to run the British out of town goes to the Haifa refinery, the end of the pipeline where Arab day workers were lining up um, for work. The workers who uh, spent the day there were brought inside. Those who were still outside, the Etzel came by in a truck and they lobbed a bomb at them. Um, and so, uh, there were deaths and um, severe injuries. Inside the refinery proper, the labor force was of a mixed Jewish Arab nature, so, but the Arab workers were in the majority. Um, there was an attack, not by everyone by any means, but there was an attack of Arab workers against Jewish workers. Um, the British hid in the office, so in some cases the refinery was locked, and anyone who wasn't um, uh, spirited out by someone else um, was um, killed. Uh, so there was this whole turning of worker against worker in 1948, and this refinery incident began a chain of attacks and retaliations that forever transformed Haifa and really um, touched off the war. What's strange to look at the British record from this time is that the company records is that there's absolutely no mention of um, partition, war, the refinery incident. Instead, the company spends the years of 48, 47 to 48 debating whether they're going to expand um, the 16 inch uh, diameter um, pipeline to 20 or 30 inches. So all of this is uh, spiraling kind of out of control and uh, they say nothing about it. We can get to Israeli nationalization after and the questions, but um, here is what I do want to say coming up um, to that moment of um, eventual nationalization and how when uh, these countries nationalize, as I said, the concession structures largely stay in place, but the space that does get nationalized is already a military space. This is a map of uh, the H's and the K's, if you will. These were the uh, military outposts along the route of the pipeline. That um, it, right, it's where the, the planes could stop. It's where armed men um, were positioned. And so these are all bases. I'll, I'll get a better picture so you can see all the H's. But I like that one. That's the original one. Um, okay, here's the. Let me just, uh, just run through here. So the pipeline had five official bases one relief station and landing grounds that anchored the aerial room and policed the pipeline. Okay, so there was H1, 2, and 3 in the Anbar province. These uh, bases formed the backbone of the Iraqi Air Force. Uh, H4 in uh, a town called Ruaishid uh, became a Jordanian uh, army base close to the Iraq border, and H5 became the birthplace of the Jordanian um, Jordanian Air Force. And so what happened, here, we actually go back a little bit. There was no official H 
in Palestine, but there was, um, this was kind of the unofficial H7, built by Roald Dahl, James with a giant peach. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and this, um, today, is the Ramat David Air Force Base. Uh, in Israel, this was the first Israeli Air Force Base. Why was it the first Israeli Air Force Base? Because the British go and the Israelis inherit this Air Force Base. Um, in 1948, actually, the Egyptians thought that the transfer had already taken place, so they started bombing it because they thought it had gone over to Israel. And so the uh, British, in retaliation, almost um, end up knocking out most of the Egyptian Air Force because the transfer um, had not um, had not yet happened. One eyewitness told me that the British picked off the Egyptian planes like flies. Um, and all kinds of interesting things happen. So when Iraq goes to attack Israel in 48, they come right across the um, Jordan um, River, uh, exactly intending to conquer the entire route of the pipeline. So Iraq's strategy in 1948 was we're going to take over the whole route of the pipeline and we will, um, we will have, um, we will have uh, control of it. So, okay, i just tell you the fate of some of the ages. Um, in the 1967 war, what's my ages? In the 1967 war, Israeli planes from that Air Force base I show you blew up the Iraqi Air Force base at H2. Um, H5 became the Prince Hassan Jordanian Air Base in 69, but didn't see action until 1970 when the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine hijacked Western airplanes and grounded them in the nearby desert. Ten days after the hijacking, the Jordanian Air Force met Palestinian fighters backed by Syrians from um, H5. It goes on and on. In the first Gulf War, Saddam Hussein launched attacks on Haifa and its oil refineries from H3. So everyone could attack each other along these ways because they all had the maps because it was along an established Air Force route. And U.S. intelligence report lists H3 as one of the chemical storage facilities eventually captured by coalition forces during the second Gulf War in 2003. So all of these bases, right, which were part of policing the pipeline, are inherited by the young nations and all used to attack um, one another. Okay, so um, other than um, uh, H2, which was destroyed um, by Israel, the remaining H bases continue to function as national air force bases, but um, at present, the ends of the pipeline are undergoing reprivatization. In 2007, BP and Shell return to their original oil fields from the concession. Um, they're right back in those um, fields that they had. And um, in terms of the, the Haifa port, the Israeli state company, Petrol Energy Company, Petroleum and Energy Infrastructure um, Limited, um, sold um, the refinery and all that installation off to um, a large conglomerate, the um, Ofer Brothers Group, also in 2007. So I, I have all kinds of theories about what, um, what is um, going to happen again um, or, or what's going to happen in the future, but I just have to show you. Here's the pipeline itself. Um, in most places, it is still there. You can see here that water is um, moving through it. This <coughs> leak is um, right near the Mafrak Depot. The Mafrak Depot was this kind of center of pipeline infrastructure. Currently, um, Mafrak is the Zayatri uh, refugee camp, the biggest uh, refugee camp of Syrian refugees anywhere. It's the biggest refugee camp of um, Syrian refugees in Jordan. And uh, when I took this picture, there was a whole question about how the water needs of those refugees would be met so here. Um, yes, but here it is um, moving across Jordan, and here it is, and we can talk about it in a moment, because uh, in its Israeli duration, there's some pretty complicated and protracted uh, privatization struggles um, that are, um, that are um, going on. 
So um, there are plenty of theories, right, um, that this pipeline was only possible in a kind of a colonial setting, right, that nationalization made it impossible to have this kind of resource flows. And I hope I have at least uh, been successful, in fact, of showing how these resource flows actually created not only nationalization, but also a particular form of nationalization that we see here in this example. Thank you. But, but still closely aligned, but I think that the, 
it, it just made me think that Tim Mitchell's argument is locked in an older argument mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. empire, mm -hmm. um, and that's part of the, the force of what you're pointing out, that there's almost mis something nostalgic about <laughs> the way that he's mm -hmm. reading, um, you know, this history. Um, and, the, and so part of what's interesting for you it isn't just that you're um, pointing out a, a sort of, hist it's not a, a matter of history that you're pointing out, but it's a sort of um, self-theorization within empire and, and its relation to um, capitalist enterprises that looks quite different. Thank you. As, as always. So, this is a kind of philosophist question. I apologize for that. <laughs> and I also am not sure exactly how to make it clear. Uh, but I'm wondering about the extent to which you're making an argument about cause. Mm -hmm. That is, there to say that the imperial powers were exploiting, say, national ethnic sectarian tensions, that makes perfect sense. Nobody would have any argument about that. And, uh, you know, the details you point to are very nice ones, you know, the arming the Jews at a certain point, setting up guards in certain ways, you know, picking minority. That, that's classical imperial strategy, but it's empirical strategy that you traditionally has been thought of, I mean, by, traditionally I mean, by historians, you know, let's say pre post modern era, as it were, as exploiting differences that are already there. And it sounds to me like you want to say something much stronger in which the differences are more or less created, or maybe not more or less entirely wholly created. And I want to hear something like, do you really mean that the border between Jordan and Iraq, or between Jordan and Israel, would be different if it weren't for the pipeline? That would be a very strong case to make, and I, I want to hear what kind of evidence you have for that. Another way of looking at that, which um, looks sort of the whole picture is, when you're looking at 1910, 1911, it's very nice the way you lay that and look at that map, but nobody has any doubt the empire, the imperial powers, France and Britain, thought they could control these whole areas, were planning to, were trying to, had the means to do that, etc. But again, your story is not stuck in 1910. You want to claim that something like that, it sounds to me like going back, continues into the national era with basically the oil companies playing the role that the empires used to have. And here immediately, mm -hmm. I think someone is likely to say that the oil companies don't have the power, don't necessarily have the ambitions, mm -hmm. don't have the same kind of structure to work with mm -hmm. that the empires did. To what extent do you want to make this strong claim that first the imperial powers and then later the companies in the interest of controlling oil mm -hmm. is actually main or a main cause in uh, sort of determining the geopolitical shape of the area. Okay, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. Okay, um, so I, I wrote down three and I'll go, uh, no, maybe I'll start with an easier one for me, um, about the whole question of would the borders be different. That one I feel on very safe ground that, um, you know, I mean, those frontiers are entirely created it's not what I thought at the beginning. It's not what I thought last book, as you know, right? Um, but that the borders are actually entirely created to facilitate this kind of transport of oil. Now, there's certain things that get in the way. Um, if I go back, sorry, I don't, can't work this one very well. Um, but if I go back, you know, the, the Jordan-Saudi Arabia border really gets determined because um, the Wahhabis are... Uh, are uh, attacking, where did that go? I don't, know, I don't know, we might not see any actual borders, um, <laughs> just the, the colonial ones, but so the Jordan-Saudi Arabia border, there are actually all these border disputes in the 20s, and they sort of, you know, finally the Saudis get beat back to a certain point and a line gets drawn, and that becomes the border of Jordan. So that one is a little bit more about different groups on the ground. But when we come to Iraq, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, I mean, those are those pipeline borders. So there, I, I do feel that if the pipelines hadn't been planned, if they hadn't been planned as a dedicated French and British line, I think the borders 
would be entirely different. They're not based on anything but that. I, that one, I would argue that strongly. Um, and furthermore, the, at least in 1919, it's pretty early, but when you know these, these borders um, are determined, there are groups, Jewish and Arab groups living in the region and outside, and they're floating these different ideas. And you know, most of them are my old favorite of the Federation. Right? They're not thinking along these lines. These lines are like imposed, and then suddenly, like you're an Iraqi or you're a Syrian. Um, not that those things, you know, there's not internal affiliations or regional connections. I'm not saying that, but the borders, I feel very clear about the cause question when it comes to the borders. I don't think that the oil company development is the cause of ethnic or religious difference. I don't think that that's the case. But I guess I am going back so far in time because I think they, they are imagined in a certain way as being oppositional, in some cases, and being militarized and violent. And I don't know that those differences, I don't think these are the cause of the differences, but a way that many of those differences end up playing out and what they come to mean. I think that, I wouldn't say, I don't, I'm not firm enough to say this is the cause, but like this is the moment when people are given or not given guns or jobs or positions based on that. So I think it's a certain configuration of what difference means comes into being here. Um, Okay, and then um, you were asking me about the oil companies playing the role of empire. Maybe I put it this way. I mean, the oil companies don't have interest in surface territory, except when it has to be transported. And they end up, in case you didn't know, like oil cooling and transport, it takes a lot of water. So um, there's all of these rivers and portions of rivers and springs and the oil companies end up with the water rights to it. So you know they need just exactly what they need. And what I think I would say is that the companies, they're not working alone without governments, but have ensured over a very long period of time access and exclusive access to that product. I mean, we're, we're talking about such a short time. I mean, because, you know, I mean, we're talking about like 1972 to like 2003. I mean, that, that's the, just like this little window of time when the companies don't have exclusive access to Iraqi oil. It's not very long. And there's two wars in there, at least. Um, two wars in there. So I think that um, there has been, over this historical duration, multiple means of ensuring um, almost unfettered access to it. But I, I want to say one more thing that, that is interesting in all of this. In 2007, when the companies, and it wasn't only French and British and American that got back in 2007, the Russians have some oil fields. Um, Japanese companies do it, you know, it's a little wider than it was uh, before the second Gulf War. What happened in Kurdistan, however, is that Kurdish locals got cuts of those oil contracts. And they're not big, but they're it's significant, right? As though you have local people who have a stake in it. I would say it is not incidental that only the Kurdish Peshmerga are the only local force who are standing up to ISIS or ISIL. Um, it matters absolutely because they've got a stake in their resource wealth. People who have a stake in their resource wealth have something to lose. I mean, that's the only viable army there. It's the only group of people who figured out, managed to have some kind of... I don't mean to be perfect. No, go. It was so <laughs> definitive. I was like, yes. <laughs> No, I just actually to follow up on that because I don't really know much about Iraq, but I know more about Iraq, which is similar to Iraq, of course. It's not overtly colonized, so it doesn't have a mandate. In that sense, external state governments are not there, but it's the where it's where the Anglo-Iranian oil company is cursor of the whole deal. It's where the British first get involved seriously with oil. It's the reason that 
in that early 20th century period, it's the Iranian oil that is used to transport all the rich natives over to oil, so it's the reason that Britain actually gets a stake in oil. So it's similar, it's a similar period, a little bit different. But what I'm wondering is that um, it's a lot of what you're saying, I think it totally makes sense to me. Again, I don't know enough about the specifics to say that it sounds right. But I think that maybe there are also there are more layers of actors, exactly in the way that you're identifying now in the contemporary period with the Kurds. And early back, at least again, with Iran, when, and it's different, it's not a pipeline issue, it's more about oil and refinery. So it's a much more, it's a much more localized space, and it's about huge development, industrial development, and building a city and bringing a population. So it's, in that sense, it's very different. But the other thing that's interesting about that early Iranian history is that the central state is barely functioning, which I think is sort of parallel. So it's not only the central state, Faisal, or at first it's the Qajar, and then it's Reza Shah, it's also their local, essentially, warlords who've sort of been the proxy people who've been negotiating with the British over trade and other things. And they have to be sort of placated. And then there's the central state that actually wants to take over policing because they see policing as actually part of nation building. And they have to, they're arguing both with the company, but also with then the consular officials, but also with these local tribal leaders. So I'm just wondering about stuff like that, because yeah. even things like private property, when you said in passing that people aren't compensated, but often in these areas there wasn't private property. Mm -hmm. There was tribal common property, and part of what, again, in Iran at least they did, is they paid off tribal leaders who got rich and went to Tehran, and leaving their local populations destitute without access to land. So again, I don't know, but I'm just wondering who else is involved with this, yeah. and if precisely when those concessions last so long, mm -hmm. somebody else is getting something, presumably. Even if it's not necessarily the central government, yeah, yeah. like what else is? I'm just assuming yeah. something else is playing on there. It seems not as good. It seems like the Iranian warlords made out better. <laughs> um, in the Jordanian case and the Iraqi case, you know, because again, it's the pipeline ends up going through Anbar, right, and then going through Eastern Jordan. I mean, these places have never been very densely populated. Um, it's part of it. The their only access to um, any kind of wealth road was guarding it. And so there, there was a big fight because um, Globe Pasha, this Englishman, sets up the Trans-Jordanian Frontier Force, and he wants to have a real force, and he's like trying to get, I don't know if he was trying, they were trying to get better pensions. Um, but then the Trans-Jordanian Frontier Force couldn't put down all the sabotage. So they tried to go through and get different tribal leaders to start militias to police the pipeline. And, but they don't really want to be malicious, so at a certain point, they pay people off not to attack it. Um, so that's the you know so so you could you could get paid as a tribal leader if you could ensure like a certain number of people wouldn't attack it. Um, that was the I mean, and still the memories. I mean, there aren't that many people still alive that remember it. Um, but I traveled it. You know, like, hey, anyone know where the pipeline was? Um, the memories are, are pretty bitter, and the other way the memories are are how it uh, really divided areas. That you had really anti-British people, and then you had some pro-British people who were exactly those people you're talking about, who got paid off a little bit, and then it tore apart a lot of families and, and whatnot. Um, so I, I know you said you don't want to talk about it, but I'm wondering, in order to sort of make the case for I think a lot of questions that are coming up, I'm wondering if you do have to talk about that French French. Mm -hmm. In other words, it, two pipelines started from the same point but then split off. Mm -hmm. And you're making certain claims about what one of them does. Mm -hmm. But not necessarily about what the other one other one does. It seems to me you can't quite make a case without at least elaborating the differences um, in terms of what happened around the other ones, and whether you're explained it by different, you know, the difference in British colonial practices to French, French. colonial practices, or um, it looks like that one ends in Tripoli. Yeah. So, you know, who yeah. had the port of Tripoli with the French? The French. Um, because it seems to me that without, I mean, in some sense, you have the perfect opportunity to create mm -hmm. an argument precisely by either illustrating the sameness or illustrating the right. difference from a process that is presumably quite similar, but the 
concessions are either slightly different or the various antagonistic parties are different. Um, but there's, I can't remember quite the point in your talk, there's like you can't really make some of the claims you want to make without, uh, the French without you know, I know they're like, oh, that's so much more research, but. No, <laughs> I don't know. someone comes and tells me I'm all wrong, okay. and they do the French line, right? right? Um, yeah, but it's, it's yeah. a great opportunity in a certain sense because you know you have that same point of origin. Mm -hmm. How did I either diverge or yeah. converge in terms of shaping the geopolitical yeah. situation? Um, and what would that do to? Because yeah. then you can deal with issues that Sam is asking you to deal with about causation. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it's a series of claims mm -hmm. without necessarily mm -hmm. pointing to causation or even mm -hmm. Being able to draw any kind of even a blurry line between cause and effect. Um, so it's just it's just a thought. I'm, I know, you know you're you want right. To I know there, but I just uh, no. It's true. I mean, you know, so it's like the practicalities of it. My French is bad. Yeah. No, uh, I don't know anything about so little about Shiism. Yeah. You know, it's like Syria. I don't know. You know, so in this case, I'm. Jordan, Palestine, and Israel have been working on it for a while. I'm like, okay, so go a little east. You know, <laughs> the records are in English. You know, I'm there. I like got it covered. Um, yeah, no, no, you're right. I mean, in the Syria, the Syria one has a much, much longer history. Yeah. Um, because that's the one that gets expanded, and that's where Iraqi oil goes. I mean, that's how until a few years ago. I mean, that's a really different longer story um, and it does get closed a few times I mean yeah yeah I see what you mean though um, yeah I do see what you mean yeah, if you want to say that those lines shape how everything was drawn does the, does the northern line shape end up shaping you pie I shot <laughs> <laughs> there was only one <laughs> So, I, I mean, I guess, can I just maybe um, disagree with exactly that, in the sense that, like, I don't, I, I guess, the way I understand your project today, after I've heard a little bit more about it, is that you're trying to picture totality, to me, you're trying to picture totality. You're trying to have some kind of total picture of something. And I guess what I'm, what I'm wondering is how is it that you're trying to kind of tell, this, tell that kind of total story? And it seems, okay, so it's not the nation. It can't be the nation. Based upon a kind of earlier question or comment, it can't be empire, because that seems to be the kind of nostalgic version of it. Um, it can't be religion, because you're suggesting that these, these, some of these tensions were created by the pipeline itself and the surveillance of it, and so on. So I mean, I guess I wonder: is it is uh, is your kind of picture of totality, in fact, just another example of capital as totality? Mm -hmm. Which is to say that like you wouldn't need empire to tell that story because capital is for much longer than that. And that's why, to me, it seems that kind of natural resource extraction becomes your version of totality, mm -hmm. which is that, like, okay, here's the, here's the moment, you know, kind of telling another story of capital as totality now through, because I know you're kind of interested in it, you're now through the kind of subterranean mm -hmm. natural resource Anthropocene great extraction kind of thing, where it's like, listen, we don't need nation to tell the story, we don't need religion to tell a story, we don't need any of this. What you in fact need is survival, mm -hmm. human survival, mm -hmm. and even maybe prosperity, mm -hmm. right? Something like that, not, not just the kind of water going through the pipeline, but something more like, okay, how do we fuel the British Navy? Mm -hmm. And the British Navy obviously having, you know, a large stake in capital. And, and so, that, so <coughs> finally then, uh, the reason why I think that kind of capital is your total your total picture is because of your reliance on sabotage, which is deeply embedded in the history of capital and the transportation specifically of resources across national boundaries and transnational boundaries and so on, right? Where sabotage becomes like the only way to disrupt a network of extraction and transportation of that and so on that like local tribes, and I think that that's kind of the Iranian question here, like local tribes are the ones who might have some kind of claim to that, which is to say, like, this is where we live, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so how do we do this? How do we come up against, how do we fight against a huge network that we can't even picture 
perfect. They gave us the picture. Here's the pipeline. And so let's burn it. Right. Right? So that's why, again, it's like the way I kind of see it, maybe that's wrong, but the way I see your project is you're trying to produce a total picture. And every time you kind of, kind of did it, you laugh because it sounds kind of conspiratorial. Right? It's like, oh wait, it can't be that, it can't be a conspiracy, right? it can't be all these kind of things lining up, but in fact, it kind like, of is. But they line up around capital, again. Yeah, yeah, it's a... So, I, you know, yeah. I mean... No, it's a really smart point, and I, I, okay, I guess one question lingers, right? The question that lingers, then, is, you know, can you have resources outside of or apart from capital, right? So you know, is there some is there some <clears throat> apparatus to think about that in a different system? So then, <clears throat> you know, part of one line I don't you know I don't know the, the full direction, but you know, one line I explore is like, okay, this is the cautionary tale. This is how it happened with oil. But so what if sure. you know we're at the moment where these similar processes are in place with water supplies? And so then what if this, this is the cautionary tale that opens itself up to something outside of it? But, you know, doesn't quite answer your question. Just... You know what, I want to um, actually <laughs> take, take this moment to um, invite you all to the reception that we do have, um, while there's still enough of us to go. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I, I know a lot of some questions on one of them, but um, maybe we can Great. cover you with a moment there. Thank you. Thanks.